to Crosstalk NATO. I'm joined by my guests, Martin McCauley in London. He's a specialist on international affairs at the University of London. Also in London, we have Jonathan Steele. He is an international affairs commentator for The Guardian. And in Washington, we cross to Ricardo Alcaro. He is a visiting fellow at the Center for the U.S. and Europe at the Brookings Institution. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want. And I very much encourage you. Jonathan, if I go to you first, uh, the Cold War has been over for over two decades. We still have this alliance in existence and there are many people that are very critical that it will continue to expand and some will even go as far to say this is at maybe the center of the problems going on in Ukraine is that Brussels is very interested in absorbing even further countries to the east this time Ukraine. Well, I'm certainly of the school that thinks that NATO should have disbanded at the end of the Cold War. I mean, NATO lost an enemy and then it's now tried to find a new role. It should have recognized that uh, it was over. We were a different continent now, different climate, different context. There were no enemies in Europe anymore and we should collaborate. But instead of that, the, the basic agenda of NATO has still been an anti-Russian agenda and they've been trying to absorb as many countries into that, uh, into that alliance as possible. But in fact, you know, it serves very little military purpose, NATO, um, when it's really only a coalition of the willing. The idea that Article 5, that one yeah. country, if it's an attack, that all countries will come to its aid, is, is, is useless now because at the time of the Kosovo intervention by NATO against Serbia, it was a coalition of the willing. In 2001, after 9-11, when NATO came forward with, an, with a statement saying that, that they would help the U.S. in defense as art and, and, uh, ratif and you know, um, put into action Article 5, the U.S. just ignored it. They weren't particularly interested in NATO at that stage. They wanted to go after uh, the al-Qaeda in, in, uh, in Afghanistan on their own. And so NATO really has ceased to be anything other than a, a toolkit in the American imperial mission. Okay, Ricardo, that's a pretty strong statement there, you know, a, a part of the toolkit of uh, American foreign policy. After all, I mean, if you look at where it's been used, its force, it's been outside of its area of sensitivity, its, its original core, the, the North Atlantic. How do you respond to what Jonathan just said? Well, actually, I, I tend to agree with him with much of what he said. Um, perhaps I wouldn't, be so, I wouldn't be so certain that NATO has pursued an anti-Russia agenda, but certainly NATO's enlargement has not been brought forward uh, according to a consistent principle. And this principle is actually commonsensical. I mean, uh, in my opinion, NATO should expand whenever that expansion round increases, enhances its security. When that is not the case, then NATO enlargement should not take place. So in my opinion, there was a, a good rationale to expand NATO to Eastern European countries in the 90s, as there is a good rationale to, to do the same thing for the Balkan countries. But the offer to, um, the offer to Ukraine and, and, and Georgia back in 2008 to, uh, for a prospect of NATO membership in the, in the, in the future, that was, that was very ill-conceived because it contrasted with basic principle I've just said. Martin, how do you look at it? Because uh, obviously from where I'm sitting in Moscow, it is seen as very much an anti-Russia alliance. And again, if you looked at the, the association agreement that the Yunukovych didn't uh, sign, if you look very closely at the fine print, it does talk about military intelligence, um, uh, joint work, uh, mutual work. And this is, sets off a really big red flag here is that the expansion just continues. And what other reason could it be is that what uh, hem in Russia? That's it. It's, it's plain his day here? I think that if you start off with in 1949 when it was set up, um, Europe was divided between Eastern Europe, which was pro-Soviet, which was under the Soviet Union, and then the rest of Europe. So therefore, it really had a meaning and was really to protect Germany and other countries. And they felt without the American umbrella, they faced uh, an existential threat from the Soviet Union. Now that's all gone because uh, uh, NATO originally was there to uh, rebuff a Soviet military attack uh, from a conventional and uh, nuclear point of view. That's gone. So then what's left? You're left with the countries of Eastern Europe which feel insecure vis-a-vis -vis Russia. If you look at Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czech Republic, they're very happy. They want to be inside uh, a larger um, security framework because on their own they feel they couldn't uh, resist any Russian pressure. So therefore uh, it's mainly a function of their perception of the Russian threat. Uh, 
you may say and others may say there is no threat there certainly is no Russian military threat towards Western Europe. Exactly. Uh, Russia is not going to attack Western Europe. Of course. But the, but the little countries are afraid of pressure which could in fact uh, force them to make concessions which they don't want to make and they feel happier within uh, a security framework which is NATO. They like to be in the European Union because then well, you Martin, have the Euro but and, Martin, do you think that wider, do, you, do you think uh, these same countries grouping. in Eastern Europe like sending soldiers to fight America's war in Afghanistan? Well, they've got to do that because it's a, co it's a coalition of the uh, willing. If they don't do that, then the Americans might not give them any military aid, or they not, might not take them seriously. So who's pressuring, say, well, who's pressuring us, whom here? Do. That's very interesting. Who's pressuring whom? Jonathan, if I can go to you, if you look at what NATO's been doing in the last few years, and, and Libya comes to mind, I mean, this is, it, it, it's, 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 it's strategy, it's structure, it's mission. I cannot I, I fathom what it is, okay? Why why is NATO being called upon to go to uh, change regime in Tripoli? I mean, that's again has nothing to do with the origins of this alliance. No, I agree with you, and I think what you said about Ukraine is really important. I mean, uh, what is happening there is, is still part of this old drive to get. Ukraine into a military alliance with NATO. I mean, just the other day at the Munich Security Conference, the Secretary General of NATO, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, made the statement, Ukraine must be free to choose its own path without external pressure. Well, I mean, what that meant was they, they should be allowed to join NATO without Russia stopping it. But the reality is that every single poll that's been taken in Ukraine over the last decade has shown a majority of Ukrainians against joining NATO. Yanukovych came to power in 2010 on a platform of keeping Ukraine non-aligned. The Ukrainian parliament then subsequently adopted a resolution saying that Ukraine's nat national security strategy would not include NATO membership. So why on earth didn't Mr. Rasmussen say something like, you know, Ukraine has opted for non-alignment and we in NATO respect that decision? Okay. Instead of the hat, okay. which We're, would be a recognition of reality, he kept up this idea that NATO must <laughs> Be and uh, Ukraine must be part of NATO. You, you know, Kather, there's a, a lot of criticism of NATO is that either it expands or it ceases to exist. How do you react to that characterization? I, I wouldn't see that trade off whether it expands or ceases to exist. Actually, I think that it can keep on uh, going uh, if it does not take uh, ill conceived moves, steps like, like offering again to Ukraine or even Georgia the prospect of, of becoming a member. Um, I would like to pick up on what Martin was saying. I mean, it's true, NATO has no single uh, purpose any longer as it used to have during the Cold War, of course. Uh, it has now, I mean, it has been suffering a sort of crisis of identity for 20 years and even more now. But I still think that NATO is, even though now it is more a sort of an alliance a la carte, it still relies on a very strong bargain. I mean, uh, Allies have different objectives, however. They trade off their security interests in the alliance, and what they get in return is, is still uh, to their advantage. So, for instance, the minions, the European uh, minions, so there's more countries, for instance, in Eastern Europe, they still feel threatened by Russia. So, uh, U.S. commitment to their security is by far the greatest guarantee that their territory uh, will not be ever invaded or will not be ever threatened. Uh, countries such as Italy or Germany, uh, which, are, which do not feel threatened by uh, Russia or, or anybody else, uh, for that matter, still see NATO as a, as a very important privileged access to, to the United States. And the military powers in Europe, France and Britain, they see NATO as the platform on which they can actually uh, still project power internationally and amplify their international influence. Well, uh, you know, and then well, there is the United yeah, States. But, which but Britain and France does its own thing on its own in Africa, for example. Ma Martin, it seems to me that NATO is just a fig leaf. It, all it is is for American hegemony and, 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 and um, expanding American military might. I mean, they can say, look, all the, this coalition of willing, you know, the, the good Westerners were all together. It's a fig leaf. It's not true. Yes, the Americans are, dominate NATO, but uh, must remember that they're cutting the military budget. Uh, and Obama doesn't believe in American exceptionalism, so therefore he is not conducting the foreign policy that George Bush or Ronald Reagan would have conducted. So therefore, NATO, from that point of view, is becoming less Americocentric 
Uh, but of course, France, from its point of view, it wants to get involved in Africa. It doesn't want Al Qaeda to expand. And you could see France then saying to the other members of NATO, you should help us. And uh, uh, apparently, there's a British military mission in Mali and so on. Uh, therefore, that part of the world has to be made secure and it must not be handed over to the terrorists. So, therefore, uh, the NATO will in inevitably expand its influence into regions like that, and countries such as France will try and draw in NATO. But to go back to Ukraine, uh, one of the reasons why NATO would like to get involved in Ukraine is because then uh, you uh, get nearer and near Iran, because the, mm. the real problem is Iran. Uh, Iran, um, Ukraine is not a threat. There's no threat, military threat from Central Asia. There's no threat from Russia. But the threat they perceive is from uh, Iran and the Middle East. So therefore, if you can get round, if you can in fact circle Iran, uh, then you're doing very well. You get greater, uh, greater presence there and so on. So NATO in many ways is expanding its mission because it's like Parkinson's law. All right, um, gentlemen, we're gonna I'm going to jump uh, in here. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on NATO. Stay with RT. Okay, I'd like to go to Jonathan in London. Uh, Martin brought up uh, the issue of Iran, which I think is very interesting, is because this this tells us how honest and legitimate uh, the West, particularly the United States, is in dealing with Iran. Because if they can get a deal, then why do they need to expand? Okay, anti-missile defense and all of this here. But at the same time, we hear that NATO needs to have, should be in, um, uh, in have a presence in Ukraine. I mean, they're certainly contradictory. There, it's certainly a two-track here. But I would I would disagree with Martin. Is that if, if we we have a NATO ships controlling the Black Sea. This is not in Russia's geopolitical interest when we look at the Middle East and beyond. Go ahead, Jonathan. No, I, certainly not. I mean, I, that's why this alliance is so dangerous. You know, when the United Nations was set up at the end of the Second World War, the idea was to set, have a military strategic committee which would, you know, run international peacekeeping operations or even war fighting if that was necessary. So that would be much better. The, the UN should do this because the UN is universal and people should, we expected, the big powers were expected to earmark contingents of forces that would be available to the UN on a permanent basis under UN command. But unfortunately that's not happened because national sovereignty has come into the way and of course US uh, reluctance to uh, submit any kind of uh, part of its activities to international uh, scrutiny. And so we've got NATO now as the kind of world's policeman. But this is quite wrong. We should be trying to limit the scope of NATO, not expand it. You know, Ricardo, you brought up your very first point in this program is that expansion creates more risks. But, you know, ha having Ukraine, for example, hypothetical in the alliance, does that really create more safety for the alliance as a whole? I don't see it. No, absolutely. Quite the contrary, quite the contrary. And that's why I think that Ukraine won't be a NATO member, not at least in the foreseeable future. I mean, there are, you said that uh, NATO is a, a fig, I mean, you, you brought up the, the argument of the fig leaf. NATO is a fig leaf for U.S. foreign policy. To a certain extent, definitely, because of the U.S. Uh, much greater sway than any other ally on the alliance, uh, NATO is an instrument in the US for, of U.S. foreign policy. But NATO is also an alliance which has its, uh, in which uh, all, all allies have their own rights and duties. And I can make you, I can assure you that um, offering again Ukraine a, a concrete prospect of membership is pretty much not an issue uh, which is welcome in, 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 in many European countries, particularly in Western Europe. And I don't see them giving their consent uh, to moving that item forward in NATO's agenda. Uh, I would actually, I would also uh, uh, contest the interpretation of Ukraine being a strategic asset in terms of, of, uh, of Iran. I mean, this is, in my opinion, bringing things a bit too far. It's really speculative. Okay, but Martin, I'm, I'd like to keep with that point there because, I mean, I remember um, Foreign Minister Lavrov said if we get a deal with the RAND, then we don't need to have to worry about anti-missile defense expansion in Europe and, um, and ergo, um, uh, NATO's interest in Ukraine. I mean, you, you can't have it both ways. It has to be one way or the other. 
Yes, Lavrov, uh, Sergei Lavrov is right there, uh, that if Iran is denuclearized, if there's no threat of uh, nuclear weapons in Iran, you don't really need then a shield uh, against those missiles, uh, and you don't really need to put Iran in the doghouse. Uh, perhaps you can uh, 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 arrange some type of um, uh, modus vivendi with Iran. But, of course, uh, when you look at a military um, organization, militaries always want to fight wars. Uh, they always want to be active. They're always looking for somewhere to get involved in. And it's up to the politicians to hold them back. The, the rationale of a military, of an army, is to get involved somewhere. So therefore you have all these huge armies and huge defense expenditure uh, throughout the Western world, which is built up during the Cold War, which were, were legitimate in those days. And now people would say, we can't really afford any more of that. So therefore uh, NATO has to rethink uh, its policy. Uh, and the key uh, really to the future, perhaps, is in fact Southeast Asia. Uh, because countries like Vietnam, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and perhaps even the U.S. Yes, US will be saying, uh, what about uh, the rising power of China? Because everyone knows that uh, the real power, the real threat, perceived threat uh, to the United States and to the West uh, will come from China. Uh, and uh, uh, China's rising power yeah, has but, to be dealt but, with. But, you know, we American still have the Obama sweet. administration making a commitment to NATO. Jonathan, I'll just be the cynic that I always am. I mean, at least the defense industries make money off of this, okay? You've got to upgrade, you've got to upgrade, you've got to buy it from America, you've got to buy it from the certain suppliers here. And the taxpayers pick it up here also. It, it's, the, the, that's a cynic, but it's happening. No, I mean, that, that's obviously one of the rationales for the continuation of NATO. They want to sell American high-tech weaponry, aircraft, submarines, missiles, all the rest of it, to uh, new countries, new, new markets, expanding markets, because most of these countries, of course, relied previously on Soviet equipment. So there is a strong economic, uh, geopolitical element behind this whole expansion of NATO. Then there's the way that el elites get bought up. You know, these elites in these new countries, like Albania and Macedonia, that are on the edge of NATO, or recently to join NATO. They, they, they like the free trips to Washington, being treated as equals, being, being, being given the high-tech training and all the rest of it, and feeling they're joining some kind of, uh, you know, sophisticated European white man's club. And, and it's very, you know, it's very seductive. It's hard to resist that. But some countries manage to do it. I mean, even the Finns, Finland, for example, is not in NATO, in spite of pressure from the Americans for even Finland to join NATO. You know, Ricardo, if you look at the history of NATO recently, um, you know, it, all it does is, is threaten or attack oh. poor countries in the world. It, it really, you know, it's, it doesn't, it's not going to fight a major war with anyone. Who's the enemy? Certainly Russia is not the enemy. But, it, it, you know, we look at the Arab Spring and we look at what's going on all the way from Afghanistan all the way to the Atlantic here. There's plenty of things that NATO can step on and get involved in. We have the example of Libya, which is, I think, their sterling, outstanding moment of the entire history of that alliance, in a negative well, way, of course. Um, yeah. But let me get back. Uh, okay. Let me get back a second to what John was saying. I actually think that NATO's rationale is still much more political and strategic than than certainly economic. I don't see an economic rationale for NATO. I mean, I don't see NATO being so essential in the U.S. military defense and mili uh, industry military and defense industry selling its items ar across the world. Not, not least because, I mean, <clears throat> among the best, the best uh, customers of the U.S. Uh, uh, defense champions uh, are, are governments which are not within NATO. Uh, so I wouldn't, see, I wouldn't see that element as being so, so critical. While I, I still see the political element, the bargain between uh, uh, Europeans who want the, Euro the United States to remain committed to their security and the United States who wants yeah, the Europeans but, but, but to remain Ricardo, loyal Ricardo, allies. Ricardo, if I could, if I could jump in and, and ask you, could I, if I could jump in and ask you, I mean, they want Washington because they want the American taxpayer to pay for it because the United States pays the vast majority of the bill for NATO. So this is free yeah. riding. That's what they want. They, yeah. No, no, no. They don't. They're not. The, the security yeah. risk is really yeah. an illusion. It's just they want someone else in times of austerity, particularly now. Let the American taxpayer pick it up. The American defense industries would be more than happy to do it. I'm sorry, but it's true. Well, um, I beg to disagree, although I do see your point. I mean, I, I still think that the econ economic, I mean, the economic rationale for NATO is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, implying there is an economic rationale is very weak. Although you, what you said, 
it's true in terms of the burden sharing problem. I mean, the United States now accounts for or 75 or 80 percent of the entire defense budget spent by NATO members. So uh, there are some actually, uh, there are some people here in the United States uh, questioning the validity of NATO because it cannot really give uh, any, any added value. Uh, I still disagree with that because the political support which NATO uh, uh, European allies give the United States in missions like the one we had in Afghanistan has been, has been really critical. It's been really critical. Uh, however, I do see this problem, and I, I'm not denying uh, it, won't ha it won't weigh very heavily on the alliance's future. Okay, Martin, I, we heard just Afghanistan here. Again, another one of those outstanding moments of the alliance. I mean, I said in the in introduction, you know, an ambiguous adventure, but it's a, absolutely a, a catastrophe. It's a catastrophic failure, and the alliance really showed what it is. It's really not effective here without American power. That's absolutely right, because... Afghanistan is a success from a NATO point of view that they've got so many countries to contribute troops. But if you look at the German contingent, they refused to fight. Uh, they were not going to get any, involved in any offensive operations. So Afghanistan, from a military point of view, is a defeat, uh, as was Iraq. And uh, the Afghan uh, lesson, I think, will be learnt that you will have no future large NATO involvement in a Muslim country or perhaps even in any other country, to try and change uh, the uh, government, to try and change the way society is run and so on. So Afghanistan is, in fact, a high watermark. It's a, it's a, it's a watershed. It's a Rubicon. Uh, and after this, NATO, no government in Western Europe, would permit, would vote for uh, uh, an involvement like Afghanistan in the future. Uh, one has the example of Syria where the MPs uh, in Britain rebelled against the British government decision to get involved. They said, no, we're not going to do that. And the reason for that was, of course, Afghanistan. Why are we getting involved in Syria? And that's the reason why NATO will not get militarily involved in Syria or anywhere else in the Middle East. The big question is, what happens then if Iran gets a nuclear weapon? That will be a key question, uh, and that really will be decided by the Americans and the Israelis. Jonathan, there are people that say that well, NATO... I, I just NATO, to come they, in they, on that. Go ahead, but there's, we're last, last 30 seconds well, here, but there, there are people saying that Martin it should be global, think... that NATO should be global. Go ahead. No, I just, first of all, may I just uh, deal with one thing that Martin said. I mean, I, I, I think it was a watershed Afghanistan, but I, it, it, the, the problem that the American and British publics have about Afghanistan and Iraq was the ground troops in there. There's still mm. the use of NATO air power in Libya, for example, which was already mentioned several times, and in Syria. The danger has not yet passed that the Americans might like to strike uh, Syria, the Syrian government forces with, with air power or with drones. Uh, and the British and the French might go along with that too. So NATO is not yet out of the picture yeah, in of, terms of All right, Syria. gentlemen, on that but point there, global, it's not no. out of the picture. We've run out of time. Many thanks to my guests today in London and in Washington. And thanks to our viewers.